What do we need to do to fix our processes to truly reduce risk and vulnerabilities? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And joining me for this very episode, you know him. I hope you love him. My co host for this episode, it's Steve Zalewski. Steve, say hello to the audience. Hello, favorite audience. Ah, that was the correct answer. Our sponsor for today's episode, Steve, is Brinka. Thank you so much, Brinka. Brinka orchestrates the entire cyber risk lifecycle across all security programs, including understanding the attack surface, prioritizing vulnerabilities, automating remediation, and continuously monitoring cyber hygiene. Kind of like what you all need. Well, guess what? We're going to be talking a lot more about Brinka later in the show. But first, Steve, let's talk about the question that you posed on LinkedIn. It's echoed in the opening tease. And you said, quote, what needs to change to truly reduce risk and vulnerabilities? It's not something security does. They need to work with all departments by improving process, communication, and motivation. We kind of isolated it to those big three. So you asked for experiential advice, and a lot of the conversation was around the general misunderstanding that security is supposed to fix everything. Some saw vulnerability management as a technical matter for IT and security, but really it's a business risk reduction issue for which each department has a responsibility, and that's where we need process communication and motivation. Correct, Steve? Yes, and I really use this as a test case because what we were trying to find, at least for me, is for the people that were responding, are they technically focused, risk focused, or business focused? And I think it really gave us a good sense of kind of the split between the three. Well, we're going to discuss this very issue today with our sponsor guest. Very excited that he is joining us today. It is the CEO of Brinka. I believe he started in the mailroom, but he's now CEO. It is Ahmad Fida. Ahmad. Did you start in the mailroom? Absolutely, David. Just like everybody else, I did. You see, there's hope for everybody. What do most people think it is? And what's the reality? John Scrimcher, CISO of a Contour Brand, said, quote, security needs to be treated as a function of the enterprise risk program instead as a service within IT. As a risk reporting to the enterprise risk program, it will get similar view to financial risk, geopolitical risk, and all other risks the business cares about. If the business views it as just another IT service, the conversation gets muted by operational challenges rather than the actual risk. And Chris Holden, CISO over at Crum Enforcer, said, the quicker you can get away from addressing vulnerabilities and begin demonstrating the risk those vulnerabilities contribute to your system or application, a more streamlined and meaningful action plan and conversation can occur. For this to be successful, you will need at minimum a business impact analysis for each system, as well as incorporating threat intelligence into your vulnerability management program. So two really good quotes, very much on the get away from the technical as fast as you can and get this on risk. Right, Steve? Right. But here's where I thought this was interesting was at least we were moving to a risk conversation. But the thrust we were going for is don't make risk the stick. How are we trying to enable the business processes that the risk is trying to improve to remove this type of risk compared to the others. And so I thought both quotes were very good in that we're moving in the right direction, business impact analysis, absolutely to know the business, right? Treat it like the other business risks like finance, but we still have to take that last step in my mind, which is why do people care, not why does the business care? Very good point. So actually, what you're referring to gets to the issue of motivation. Ahmad, is motivation really only a stick here? Because Steve said, this sounds like a stick. So the motivation really is for business to understand and reduce the risk that they're taking or that exists on behalf of the business. Now, cyber's goal, obviously, after doing a lot of hard work to discover these vulnerabilities, these security findings, how do we make them actionable? So the, the risk conversation really puts that into a framework where once you understand the business context, 
the motivation is not so much about because security or vulnerability team is is saying so or nagging. It's more of a self service. You're taking a decision on behalf of the business priorities and how that enables you to accomplish those goals. So it's a very different conversation moving from technical to business risk. So it isn't a shift necessarily that has to happen. It's just framing the conversation, if you will. And as I'm hearing you correctly, you're not even bringing up technical at all, right? Absolutely. And part of that is a little bit of democratization of the data, right? How do we get this data in front of folks, either their IT owners, application owners, business owners, executives, we're asking these questions, are we safer? Are we getting better at addressing some of the, the key gaps that exist in our cybersecurity program or systems? And talking in terms of vulnerabilities or log4j or SSL issues are not going to get you anywhere. So we are talking about reframing, as you said, David, the conversation in terms and in context that a business can really evaluate and address and understand that by doing so, it's not only making the business more secure or providing protection, but it actually enables them to grow the business. Sometimes there's a really easy solution. Jonathan Waldrop of Inside Global said, quote, we can avoid vulnerability from the start if we don't have to over-customize software to match an outdated business process. Not every risk or vulnerability has a CVE number, nor does it have a technical solution. And Matt Black of Content Stack said, if you can meet people where they are, you can usually develop a good process or plan to reduce the risk to an acceptable level and ensure the team who has to make a change is bought in on what you're doing. And Eric Block of Atlassian said, if you can put yourself in their shoes, you'll make it a win-win. So, Ahmad, I like the idea that sometimes they're not a technical even solution to this. I mean, we keep saying don't have the technical conversation, but sometimes the solution will not even have a technical answer to it as well, right? And can you, if that's true, can you give us an example? If we think about from a view of the technical solution or solution even possible, a lot of vulnerabilities that when they're published, there's generally sort of three scenarios, right? You have a patch or fix available for you that you can actually deploy and apply. Sometimes the vendor hasn't released that and it takes time to research and figure out the fix. Now, there are scenarios where an organization may be getting off a technology. They have a outdated process or outdated system and they're planning maybe in three months, six months to get off that. You need to think about compensating controls and things that you can do for a period of time, almost an exception process to handle that risk. And then third is, again, another good example is if you're moving to cloud and you're traditionally have more IT infrastructure, moving to cloud provides an opportunity to do things differently. Moving to more ephemeral devices, containers, type of runtimes, where you can re-image things versus having to go and patch. So these are some of the examples in my mind where it's not the technology that's going to fix. It's actually the change in the process, understanding what business is doing in terms of achieving some of those goals and meeting them perhaps halfway or meeting how they function and work and then adjusting accordingly. Steve, have you had a situation where you just solved an issue purely through process? Yes, and it's the conversation around the easy solution. And what I say is, I'm actually getting a little bit, motivation, okay? We can talk about the motivation from a security perspective, which is we know that we have certain classes of individual that are not highly technical, right? And so therefore, they don't necessarily understand security. So how do we motivate them, right? We can tell them what to do and we can inject friction into the process or we can do something like motivate them by saying, if you're willing to do what we're talking about here, there's a higher likelihood that your bonus is going to pay out more. There you go. There's a carrot. And so therefore, we change the motivation from one of feeling stupid about security to one of understanding that there's a motivation to do better because they're going to get something. Okay. Or the other motivator is, well, if you, if you fail your security awareness training three times in a row, you're fired. There's a stick. Okay, that's a different type of motivation. Which, by the way, we've talked about an example of just that, sadly. Just that. Now I look at process, okay? And I say, 
use an example of, let's just assume it's Levi's, right? And so I had all of the stylists in the stores, all the people that would work with you and check out. And of course, you'd love to have multi-factor authentication on all the cash registers, right? But it's not practical. And so process-wise might be you sit with them and you say, you know something, we're going to put you through some extra security awareness training for you to understand how important it is to log out every time because we realize multi-factor authentication just isn't practical. So we're going to do good enough security, but we're going to modify the process again to enhance the motivation and make the process appropriate. Ahmad, let's just boil it down. Why then do processes fail? David, processes fail because we're taking a very security approach and trying to implement the security processes versus transitioning this into a business risk process conversation. And once you're able to do that, I think the the process problem goes away and essentially becomes very natural on how business works. And it will be a very practical and easy to implement approach to address this problem. Hey, before we go on any further, I do want to read a message from our sponsor, Brinka, that I mentioned the show. In fact, we have the CEO right here. And in fact, the thing he just mentioned is very apropos here. So as we know, historically, more was supposed to mean less. So one cybersecurity tool, though, after another, after another, an ever growing arsenal to keep us with, with the increasing risk exposed by a rapidly expanding attack surface. We're all getting sold this, right? But more tools in order to bring about less risk. But that's actually not what we got. Instead, more tools have only led to more complexity, more incompatibility, more silos, more pieces to the puzzle, more time trying to understand security posture to see what's what, and more hurdles to taking effective action. What we need now is more precision more laser-targeted action. And this is what we're talking about in today's episode about process and improving things here. So to manage assets and their vulnerabilities across all security tools, programs, and their attack service, to know who owns what, get to a single source of truth and surgically eliminate critical risk. This is exactly what Brinka provides to those charged with navigating the relentless chaos of securing their business our topic today. And heck, it's the topic of every one of our shows, isn't it? The Brinka SaaS platform cuts through security complexity and empowers precise action, tuned for specific environments and business outcomes. You see clearly, you act precisely, you can do it all with Brinka. So learn why companies like Adidas, Whole Foods Markets, and Coca-Cola trust Brinka. Visit their site. It's Brinka.com to learn more. Let me spell the name of the company because I don't think anyone knows how to spell any cybersecurity company's name because you cannot find it in a dictionary. Let me spell it. So pay attention. B-R-I-N-Q-A dot com. Make sure to check them out. What are the elements that make a great solution? Andy Kim, the CISO over at CyberCatch said, quote, the cybersecurity program must eliminate subjective variables as much as possible. There must be a comprehensive control testing program to prove that underlining assumptions of a risk assessment are in fact true. Think MITRE ATT&CK as the basis of these tests, not internal audit. And Ori Flyter Kotler, CISO over at Staircase AI, said, people respond better when I talk with them in person. Explain the risk what bad things can happen, the liability involved, and finally, making a very specific ask to fix the issue rather than general guidelines and best practices. You know, apply software patches, configure MFA, enable a host firewall, apply encryption at rest, restrict open ports, remove outdated container images, remove admin privileges. That sounds like a lot of technical talk, Steve, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I can see glassy eyes over the listener hearing that. I think all of us at that point were been there, done that, and it doesn't work. And I think what we've been talking about today, right, about what makes a great solution is an appreciation that there really are two types of folks that we're talking to. There are those that tell me what to do to make the problem go away. I don't care. I don't want to be part of the solution. It's just going to be a job function. So tell me and I'll be done. And if the friction is too high, then I'll either complain about it or I just won't do it. 
And then there's the second folks that want to be part of the solution. They want to understand. They care about the company. They care about security. And so they're willing to go the extra mile even to be able to accept more friction in their business process. But they do want to see something in it for them. Because ultimately, even those folks do want something. So when I look at the processes and kind of what we're talking about here is, it's got to be a win-win. There's always got to be something in it for the consumer of the controls we're going to take them. But we do realize that there are two types of consumers, those that just will do as they're told and those that really will step up and move beyond because they really care. Hey, Ahmad, I'm going to ask you a question that I sort of brought up in the sponsor read here. It's that Brinka offers a precise ability to pull out a vulnerability. I'm interested to know how exactly you're doing that, because that would speak to very much what Andy Kim here is saying is like, get rid of the subjective as best as you can and follow the MITRE attack framework as an example he gives. So I'm interested to know how is Brinka specifically finding these issues that are risk problems? Brinka takes a data-driven approach to prioritizing vulnerabilities. So taking the subjectivity out of the equation altogether. We're looking at the threat intelligence that is available to us to prioritize the business context around the assets or the attack surface itself. It's really understanding that not all assets are going to have PII or PCI or HIPAA or any kind of regulatory requirements or sensitive data stored. So once you start stitching and putting all these data points together, you come to a very precise, accurate representation of what a real impact and what the real risk is of a given vulnerability to the business, to the asset, to the process. And in addition, the visibility we provide as part of that process. We're not just coming up with a risk score or a number that's hard to understand, but we're actually providing the various risk factors that went into it to compute the, that actual score, which turned into a rating that is actually a sort of a North Star. Now, these risk factors, for example, an asset that's externally facing, as I mentioned, has a sensitive data associated with it, performs a critical business function. For example, part of an online store or serves a web application that is on the online store. Now, once you explained to somebody that these are the different elements of why we think this is important, that generally drives an outcome that's beneficial to the business as well as to security. issue is this. Andrea Schneider, who is the field CISO over at Laceworks, said, quote, put most efforts on reducing this time frame to prove that there's a positive effect of every dollar in security. Choose tools in a way to reduce friction. One tool is better than three, as every additional tool creates that friction. Kind of something we mentioned earlier. And this will eventually slow down your mean time to remediate. And David Casey of Summit Health said, no security team will ever be able to be everywhere. See everything. It takes an army these days. Engage them, encourage them, guide them. Leadership can set the pace. Security set the goal. But the employees will fight the battle. And I'll start with you, Steve, on this one. Kind of like that last comment there. Leadership sets the pace. Security sets a goal. But employees actually do the work. They fight the battle. That's what we've been going for, right? Yes. I think ultimately that needs to be the tagline for security because how we do that is a lot of the conversation for today, but the objective of what we're trying to do is get the employees to fight the good fight in a way that they're comfortable with and in a way that we can actually manage the risk appropriately for the company, which is, and I always say to myself, I'm here to make money and I'm here to protect my consumer data. So ultimately, I have to balance the need to do that with the business processes and the people to fight the good fight. And it's never going to be perfect. And I'm always going to lose a few, but generally, I want to win more than I lose. Ahmad, is there something within Brinka that the average non-security person sees and they can get that sort of sense of, ah, now I see that when we do this, 
this gets reduced? I mean, is there some visibility they get? Absolutely. With every report, with every vulnerability that we identify, we provide a solution or remediation and as well as the reduction in terms of the benefits that you're going to get, the sort of biggest bang for the buck. So you can prioritize like we should do this first because we're going to save a lot of risk issues if we do this first. Absolutely. Because we're identifying the root causes, you can look at big ticket items that if we perform this update or we transition from this technology to another technology or remove from perhaps on-prem to cloud, there is a significant risk that we can eliminate. So it's not a very tactical approach, but it's also a very strategic approach because you are looking holistically across the board, the things that you can do, the strategic initiatives you can take in order to reduce the risk in a meaningful way and bring up provides that visibility. And one of the things I'll just add here, David, who owns this issue and the previous question as well, what makes it this easy solution? Security, as Steve pointed out, is it takes a village. Cybersecurity generally is a very small team in the grand scheme of things across IT. Sometimes a team of one to three. Team of one to three. And in the times we're living in, the budgets are probably not reducing, but also not significantly increasing. So you're trying to do more with less. So you do need any help you can get from other teams. As a solution provider from somebody who builds a software service application systems that can help organizations to reduce their risk, one of the key requirements is to make this data very easily available to everybody in the organization, not just information security. That goes a long way from reducing that friction. So this is not a, just a tool for security, it's a tool for the business. It's a tool for business because you're always going to have a limited folks within the security and this allows everybody to take ownership, responsibility, and get a better understanding and then drive action. And that's our goal at the end of the day with Brinka to enable everybody in the organization to log in, get a list of prioritized work that they need to do, get a better understanding, and hopefully reduce that risk as the business priorities and resources allow. Excellent. All right. I'm going to ask one quick last question from both of you. I'm going to assume the theme of a lot of our responses was, it's not technical, it's a business issue, they should understand it's a business issue. I'm going to ask you for number two, Steve, and Ahmad, I want your answer as well. What is the second biggest understanding the business has, Steve? The second biggest issue is the cost of technical debt against the business process. Because time and time again, business processes work. And anytime you change them, it costs money. And the technical debt oftentimes is where the security teams really are challenged because they're old systems or old technologies or out-of-date processes. And so the challenge to change something that works when it is still making money because it's not functional, but non-functional risk we're addressing is the number two of why we have to meet them halfway. Excellent answer. All right, Ahmad, you close this out. What's number two, the biggest misunderstanding? Actually, I would like to add on to what Steve was talking about as as the second most important challenge is the nature of business in terms of the technology, the roadmap, the life cycle, and the fact that certain things are put in place that are hard to change. And the security has to work around it. It reminds me of a story that one CISO told me around when iPhones came out in early days the CEO of a biotech company, and it was a CISO of that company, wanted to give sales reps those iPhones because they wanted to have the communication with the clients as soon as possible while they're traveling. So no communication or emails get missed and the ability to close the deal or sell their products as fast as can. Initially, IT and security really resisted because nobody really understood where the security is around iPhones or these mobile devices. But that was a business decision and the security has to go meet the technology and the business leaders halfway, essentially really understand and put some compensating controls, whatever they could at the time. But that's another example, the challenge where you just can't live in isolation and create your own policies and standards without factoring the business needs or the growth opportunities or the things that the business have to undertake as part of being able to do their job. Excellent. Well, now we've come to the portion of the show where I ask both of you, 
What was your favorite quote and why? And I always begin with our guest because Steve stole your idea for the last one. So hopefully you'll steal Steve's favorite quote as well. Which quote was your favorite, Ahmad? Well, David, my favorite quote was from Eric Block from Atlassian. If you can put yourself in their shoe, you'll make it a win-win. And I liked it for a couple of reasons, but mainly having that it's not just empathy for business, but really understanding what a business goes through. Nobody wakes up every morning and say, I'm going to go and fix a ton of vulnerabilities. They think about how I'm going to be better at my job, how I'm going to help grow the business, how are we going to make more money? And that's what they're thinking about. And you, as a security professional, need to think about how I make their job easier. That's what I really like about information security teams that are thinking as a enabler for business, not a roadblock. Excellent. Steve, your favorite quote and why? All right. Well, I almost chose David Casey from Summit Health about security sets the goal, but the employees fight the battle. I like that. And I like that quote. But I think a lot of what we are talking about today and the genesis of the question I asked was not fight the good fight for security. I think really what we want to talk about, and my favorite is from Matt Black of Content Stack. If you can meet people where they are, you can usually develop a good process or plan to reduce the risk to an acceptable level and ensure the team who has to make a change is brought in on what you're doing. And so ultimately, it's what Ahmad was saying too, which was the technical debt, the risk that we see is meet with the people, find it halfway, right? See where that friction is with the business and negotiate the best that you can. So I'm going with Matt Black. All right. Matt and Eric win this episode. And so does Ahmad. And so do we as well. And Brinka. Lots of winners. Everybody gets a participation trophy. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Ahmad. And huge thanks to our sponsor, Brinka. Brinka, remember, orchestrates the entire cyber risk lifecycle across all security programs, including understanding the attack surface, prioritizing vulnerabilities, automating remediation, and continuously monitoring cyber hygiene. Did you remember how I spelled Brinka? It's spelled B-R-I-N-Q-A dot com. That's where you want to go immediately following this recording. So if you're driving pull over and go there right now. Ahmad, any last words for our audience? Any offers? Anything you want to say about Brinka and how are you hiring? We are Brinka. We're hiring across different teams, positions. If you're passionate about cybersecurity, vulnerability management, we have a number of positions from engineering to customer success, as well as professional services. We're looking for top talent. So please feel free to reach out to me directly with LinkedIn or our website, Brinka.com. Thank you again, David and Steve. This was a lot of fun. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to our audience. We greatly appreciate your contributions and listening to Defense in Depth. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. We have lots more shows on our website, CISOseries.com. Please join us on Fridays for our live shows, Super Cyber Friday and Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review. This show thrives on your input. We're always looking for more discussions, questions, and what's worse scenarios. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, check out the explainer videos we have under the sponsor menu on CISOseries.com and or contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth. 